I'm so happy to see everyone here today, and uh, we're gonna um, hopefully learn a lot and have a have a good amount of fun during the during our time together. So um, I did this about me section, but then I realized as uh, Kristen was saying, um, uh, introducing me, that's essentially the about me. I am a certified uh, prevention specialist with over a decade of experience. I currently oversee the Mississippi Behavioral Health Learning Network, and we provide, uh, we are funded through the uh, Mississippi Department of Mental Health to provide trainings to all of uh, their certified providers, their mental health therapists, um, prevention specialists throughout the state. Um, I have the opportunity to facilitate many new trainings each year. This was actually, this training right here, it's the first time I've ever done this training because uh, it, it was kind of retooled from a, uh, another training that I do, but uh, it is, um, Pretty different as well, so um, that that's uh, pretty exciting to uh, have the opportunity to um, be able to facilitate and design new trainings uh, every year, and not just do the same one, have a canned presentation over and over again. Uh, and then a fun fact about me, I guess, is I used to be painfully shy, and that uh, adjective is actually on purpose. Like it used to cause me. Uh, pain, like stomach pains and just uh, terrible anxiety to present, or even the thought of speaking to a group of people. Um, but, but the good news is uh, you do get to a point where you become comfortable with it. And uh, I do feel that I'm at that level now, but um, I would not be telling you the truth if I said I still don't get nervous about these things, especially um, when we have a training like today. Um, first time uh, that I presented this, I want to make sure that the uh, material is relevant for you. And speaking of you, you've heard a little bit about me. Now I want to hear a little bit about you. And we're going to do this through an interactive uh, tool that I've learned. And this is kind of a, uh, a bit of a tip. Um, if you give uh, presentations, if you see presentations and you see something that you like, um, uh, imitate and uh, take that, uh, you know, give credit if you can. Uh, the first time I saw this activity was actually in a mental health first aid training, but I've used it just about in all of my other um, online trainings for sure. And that's something called a chat storm. Now, I'm not sure if y'all are familiar with this or not, but uh, there's not a big learning curve on this. So, I am going to um, kind of explain what a chat storm is. So you should have the option to, and hopefully y'all can still see um, my presentation. It should just be a white screen right now. Sure, I've got this correct. Yeah, it is. Okay, great. So. What I would like us to do is to go to the chat box. And I want you to. Um, essentially, what we're going to do, this is how all of the chat storms work. You're going to be asked a question or given a prompt. Um, write your answer in the chat box, but the key to this activity is to do not hit send just yet. Just write your answer in the chat box. Um, oftentimes on these, I'll give about 15 seconds or um, with some of the longer answers, maybe 30 seconds. Um, and if it takes you just a couple of seconds to write it, resist that urge to hit enter or to hit send. Um, just leave it in the chat box. And then what I will do um, is say, okay, let's release our answers in three, two, one. And once we get to that point, if you will hit the, uh, the send button. So our first activity, or our first chat storm. Does this make sense? I'll give you 10 seconds on this one. Uh, just a yes or no. Is this making sense to you? Okay, and remember, do not hit send just yet. And three, two, one, release your answers. Okay, so good. Y'all, y'all got this. 
I don't have to explain this too much. Excellent. Okay. So let's go to our first real question, shall we? I want to know, like I said, this is uh, learning a little bit about you. Uh, which field do you work in? Now, remember, do not write, um, or you can write in the chat box, but do not um, hit enter just yet. Here are the options. And you can put the letter if you would like, or you can put um, the full thing. Um, A, substance abuse prevention. Substance B, substance use treatment, C, mental health counseling, or D, another field. All right, I'll give you all about 10 more seconds on this. All right, and remember, do, don't hit send just yet, but in three, two, one, release your answers. Awesome, we have some a lot of prevention people. A lot of people have A, B, and C. Great, y'all are busy. Excellent. See, it's not so hard, y'all. We got the first one under our belt. We've got a few more of these in our get to know you section. So how long have you worked in prevention? I'll give you about 15 seconds on this one. Once again, you can put the uh, letter or the uh, the title or, or the um, what it says, but don't press uh, enter just yet. Does it? A, less than six months, B, six months to one year, C, one to five years, or D, five or more years. All right, in three, two, one, let's release our answers. Oh, great, I'm seeing a lot of variety. Some people with less than six months, welcome to this field. I um, I love this field, I think you will too. There's a, it's a very rewarding field. Great, a lot of people uh, in the one year category. Um, saw someone with 15 years, excellent, excellent. Next question, how many presentations? Oh, 200 years, okay, you got me beat, Kristen, big time. There, there's always somebody that's gonna have more than you. It might feel like 200 years, but... Um, <laughs> So um, how many presentations do you facilitate each year? And remember, don't put your answer, you can put your answers in the chat box, but don't hit enter just yet. Here are the options. A, zero, B, one to four, or C, five or more. All right, and let's release our answers in three, two, one. Great, oh, whoops. I saw some really good answers earlier. Five plus. None as of yet, but there will be more. Uh, Brian, you must be new to the field of prevention because that would have been my answer at one point, and now it's definitely five or more. A Excellent. lot of five or more. Yes, and um, I don't have this as a chat question, but what is a presentation? Um, to me, it used to be you have to get in front of a whole big group of people and you have a, a set presentation that you're gonna do um, but my, it, it has kind of changed since then. Like I even view presentations, if you're, um, you know, if you have an elevator speech prepared, you know, and it's just a couple of seconds, 30 seconds to a couple of minutes, and you have to, uh, somebody ask you, what is your position? What do you do? That's, um, that's delivering the presentation. It's using those principles that we're going to discuss later. And I promise we are getting close uh, to the end of this section. So you won't have to chat the whole time. I've just got two more questions and I'm going to give you 30 seconds on this one, but uh, don't press enter just yet. But what are some concepts or strategies that you're hoping to learn from this presentation? And if you're not sure yet, that's fine. Yeah, and absolutely, uh, Rhonda, it can be um, setting up at, um, informational booths. Um, I'm actually going to a conference tomorrow and um, yeah, <laughs> we're I'm gonna probably do a hundred presentations, uh, and that's gonna be the uh, the canned variety where I say this is who we are, this is what we do. But it's good to have that. It is. It's a fantastic way um, to reach people. Okay, 
So hopefully everybody's got some answers in the chat box. Let's release them. Three, two, one. Okay, how to keep people's attention, how to hold the attention, uh, engagement. Um, a yes. lot of engagement. Great. Uh, slide design. We don't really go over slide design, but um, there is, there's absolutely something to that. Um, and there are so many tools now that can help you with slide design. Even um, the new Microsoft has a, a design function, which is... Um, I actually used a couple of in a couple of slides here, and then um, I liked the way they did it, so I um, actually incorporated it um, on several slides. How to stay on topic um, while having feedback from an audience and audience engagement, yes, and of course dealing with distractions. We are gonna um, we are gonna talk about a lot of the um, this information that you all requested, or you all just put in the chat box. So that's great. And last question, I promise, uh, for this section anyway. I gotta watch what I promise. But uh, what are some guidelines that you would like to see implemented? And while um, you know, I want us to, I want this to be an inf impactful presentation. So I'm um, hoping that um, we have some good guidelines set. I'll give you an example of one. Um, let's see and. You can write it in the write whatever in the chat box as I'm uh, thinking of this example. But a good guideline is it's actually going to be the first one that I mentioned. Um, I want us to have fun. Um, I, I feel if you can make learning fun, um, you can really help with that retention of the new uh, material. So that's that's a guideline for me. If we're not having fun, I, I don't want anyone to not be having fun. So let's release our answers in three, two, one. Respectful, oh, yeah, this is... fun, engaging. Yes. And I just saw some of the other uh, responses from the previous question, um, how to become strong, how to engage. Um, there was one I just saw. How to encourage presentation or uh, encourage participation. Yes. So thank you all so much for uh, whoops for uh, spending time with me on this. Like I said, I have a couple of guidelines myself. The big one is to have fun. Uh, the second one is to ask questions. Kristen mentioned this. I think it's uh, so important for us to uh, um, to know that we are in a uh, safe place here where we can um, ask questions, and hopefully I can get you the answer. And um, this is just something with me. I have no problem saying I don't know, but I will get back to you because I, I do enjoy a challenge every now and then. But hopefully I'll be able to answer uh, most of your questions today. And then finally, participate in activities, which you all get an A plus on that because you all have been doing so wonderful. Um, you know, I've already put you all to work in the first 20 minutes, so we'll, I'll take it a little easy on you all now. We. Uh, we will uh, have an activity a little later. We're going to have a um, a breakout session, so I'm excited about that. Um, where we'll have a uh, breakout groups. Yes, edutainment. I like that. Um, but we will have breakout uh, groups a little later, and I, I promise things go faster once you're uh, when you're all in, engaged and having fun. Uh, it really does. So those are my guidelines. Thank you for the guidelines that uh, you all um, had in there. And uh, Kristen just answered uh, your question, but this, uh, the slides will be available. And um, if you don't mind, Kristen, I can put it in the chat box right now. I have a link um, where people can download the PDF. Sure. That's okay. All right. So let me um, get my way around this really quick. Figure this out. All right, so today's agenda, we are actually, um, we're gonna talk about a uh, 
a good amount today. We um, will have a couple of breaks. I'll let y'all know that um, throughout this presentation. This is a long time, and I appreciate you all being here today. Um, but this is the this is the just or the gist of our uh, um, presentation. We're going to go over the basics, theory, and then we're going to put it into practice. So simple enough, and even the the first part, the basics, um, we see that we're going to have our terms and definitions. Uh, when we get into theories, we're going to get into um, planning, and um, then we're going to go into instructional design, um, instructional design models. We're going to look at the types of learners and how we can uh, best um, get our information in a way that's that's best for them. And then we're going to look at seating theory, which is a thing. It, it really, uh, and it goes to the first point of our theory section, planning. That's, that is really the key to a quote unquote perfect presentation is proper planning. Um, but um, there is a, uh, you know, there's, there are ways we can strategically set up our rooms, even if it's in a virtual setting uh, that will uh, help us get the most out of each learning opportunity that we have. And then finally, we're going to go over the common disruptions as well as uh, management strategies for those. How, how do we get things back on track? Yes, the theory of chairs. <laughs> yeah, I'm wondering, does someone in college actually study seating therapy? I, I think a theory, I guess so. Well, let me tell you, I, um, I, I don't know if they studied it, but I've read some of their studies. <laughs> and I'll share some of that information with y'all today. Um, but yes, uh, there, there really is. There's a, there's a lot to, um, to presentations, and it's not just. Um, like I said, it's not just what we think, even like sales techniques, there's a lot of, uh, um, and even um, negotiation uh, strategies that you can incorporate um, in, in your presentations. So our first section, we are going to go over these eight, um, act, or I'm sorry, these eight definitions. Let's start with um, disruptive behavior first, since this is um, originally this was uh, what we were looking at with this presentation, and then it kind of took on this form, which I'm I'm so happy it did. But um, disruptive behaviors are something that um, they they just happen during presentations. I would, um, you know, they say death and taxes. Are the only uncertainties, but uh, I always say during a presentation, something will go wrong. It's not going to go as perfect as you think it will, or as you hope it will. Um, but uh, that being said, we can we can really, um, you know, get prepared for that, and we can have it, you know, have essentially a strategy for that to manage that disruption when it happens. And hopefully it won't happen, but if it does, we'll be prepared. So uh, disruptive behavior, these are actions or activities that interfere with the uh, normal flow of a presentation. Uh, this could be talking, texting these days, um, or it, making any kind of uh, distracting noise. The next one is audience engagement. And this is the level of involvement and attention uh, of the audience during the presentation. Um, we, yeah, oh my, my gosh, um, going back to the uh, other distraction, the side conversations, that is, that's really tough. Um, we'll talk about some management strategies for um, some of those, but um, I've seen side conversations, well, and, I was uh, presenting on this topic a couple of weeks ago, a similar topic, and we were talking about people talking, and I can't believe people talk in movies, but, or I'm sorry, I can't believe people talk in presentations, but I've seen people talk in plays and in movies, have full-on conversations. Maybe it's on the phone, or maybe it's with another person in the, uh, in the theater with them. So um, that's very distracting. 
Um, but we want to keep our audience engagement high because the, the research says that once we, uh, the higher the engagement, the higher the motivation is for that student and the more likely they are to uh, gain something from something uh, long term, some sort of long term, uh, they call it neural interconnectivity, but uh, it's basically making a new, um, a new part of your brain, like a new, a new memory or a new factoid. Uh, the next definition, communication skills. Uh, this is the ability to effectively convey um, information and ideas through speaking or writing. I also want to add something on this. It could also be, um, it could also be um, through art or um, through images. Um, you, you know, they say a picture can a uh, picture can tell a full story. It has a thousand words. Well, um, you know, if if you uh, have the right image, it can really get a it can really hit home in a presentation. Um, it's a little trickier because we can interpret uh, images a little different than we would um, speaking or writing. And Astrid, that's exactly what I do. Um, but see that that again goes to your uh, your your um, seating theory and how your room is set up. If um, if you could easily walk to that direction, that would be great. But you know, if you're on a stage or if you're um, maybe in a larger auditorium, it it may be a little more difficult to do that. Uh, the next one, conflict resolution. Um, this is uh, the process of resolving disagreements or disputes, um, usually through negotiation or compromise. And um, we want to we want to strive to de-escalate situations. So I have this uh, this definition for us: de-escalation techniques. These are strategies used to calm us down or to calm individuals down uh, whenever there's a situation that's uh, getting a little too tense or a little too uh, volatile. Um, there are uh, a lot of techniques that we can use in this situation. Then we have active listening. This is the process of uh, paying close attention to what is being said. Um, also showing empathy and understanding and then um, giving feedback to the speaker. So active listening is more than just just hearing. It's it's being it's it's being present um, and being a part of the conversation. So um, whenever I you know maybe ask a question, that's kind of what I'm I'm looking for active listening. And y'all at any point. Please put anything in the chat box, or um, if you want to unmute, that's fine as well. Um, anything that you want to add, I, I know it will add to our conversation today. But um, active listening is something that we want to strive for. And, well, I'll go on and say this. It's something that's been a little uh, more difficult in virtual trainings because of um, all of the distractions that um, are around us, especially when we're sitting at our desk, we might get an email, then we read that, but we're still listening, but are we fully present? It's, it's just a little difficult. However, you know, I say online, but think about if we're, um, say we're listening to a, a presenter at a, um, we're in a conference and we're kind of near the back of the room and we get an email notification on our phone. So we just read it real quick. And then before you know it, we're we're doing the same things that we would do if we're um, in a virtual class. So it's um, a lot of that active, uh, a lot of this is really, um, a lot of this is on the the um, presenter. I, I really feel it is to make uh, interactive content. I um. I can't get mad at anyone if they're not interested, if I'm not presenting something in an interesting way or um, giving them, um, showing them the value in what I'm presenting. Yes, when we listen to respond, I mean, that's, you're, you're not actually hearing the other person. 
um, you're you're just waiting for your turn to talk. And yes, it, it can be um, not productive. Yeah, I, I love that you all are um, commenting so much today. Thank you. It's um, making uh, me feel a lot more comfortable. And um, our, I believe this is our final definition is presentation skills. This is the ability to effectively and confidently deliver a presentation. And remember, a presentation can be uh, anything. Um, you know, it can be uh, an hour or a three hour presentation like today, or it can be um, a two minute, a 30 second presentation. But um, the ability to um, be able to uh, be confident and deliver that is what matters. And that's that really goes to your presentation skills. The way, well, I'm not going to give any examples because we're about to do that uh, in our next uh, in our next activity. Oh, and I'm sorry, I um I missed the last one. This is uh this is an extremely important definition. Um, classroom management, much like presentation. Uh, it can have different words, uh, or I'm sorry, the uh, word classroom can have different meanings. So, um, you know, often when we think of classroom, we think maybe middle school, high school, you know, you know, we just think of, of school. It's, it's more than that. It's, uh, it's where the learning is taking place. Uh, where I am at the Public Health Institute, we have a training room, and that is our classroom. Um, but when we are in a virtual setting, this is our classroom. And classroom management refers to, uh, you know, the techniques that we use to, um, to maintain order and control in a learning environment. And I mean, once again, I don't want to give examples because that's what we're going to do in our activity. But uh, there are many examples of classroom management. So. Real quick, I want to get a pulse check. Let's see. How many of y'all are familiar with the Jamboard, the Google Jamboard? And I'm going to check the chat just to see. Okay, great. I, I love seeing all the no's. Great. Kind of love seeing that too. Okay, so we're going to walk through this together and uh, we're going to do an activity. Um, we have it scheduled for about 10 minutes or so. If it takes a little longer, it's going to take us a little longer. Um, that's that's the main reason I wanted to get you all the, um, the slides earlier, uh, because we may not be able to get to every single slide, or we might have to go through them uh, kind of quicker as we get along. Um, but um, the information is there, and you can look at it at a later time. Uh, today, during our time together, I want us to learn new skills because um, learning this Jamboard has really helped me, um, especially when we started to do a lot of online trainings. This is a way to get uh, good interactivity um, from people. Let me see. I am going to have to, uh, I'm going to put a link in the chat box in a moment. But, um, I want to explain what Google Jamboard is. It's an interactive whiteboard, essentially. And what you can do with this, it, it is free as long as you have a Google account. So if you have a Gmail account or if you have a YouTube account, um, you should be able to um, access Jamboard. And you can create your own Jamboards, share them around. And um, usually it's pretty fun to, to use this, especially in virtual settings. So what we're going to do is we're going to get into groups. We're going to do breakout rooms, and I'm going to put the link to the Jamboard in the chat box. Now, um, you'll click on that link, and then you're going to go to your corresponding group. So um, you see up here at the top, I've got a red box around it. We see 1-16. Uh, that means that um, there are 16, these are essentially slides. Each one of these pages is essentially a slide. Um, what I'm gonna want you to do is find your group. So if you're group one, you would be on the right page now. 
So, um, I haven't started and I haven't started the breakout groups yet, but no, soon no. it'll be, it'll be very clear. So don't worry. Yes, I will. Yes, you will definitely see that. I just, um, definitely wanted to go through this, um, with people, uh, with everyone, because I know we have a lot of people that haven't, uh, used this tool before. Those of y'all that are experts at it, you can kind of take a break while I'm, uh, um, explaining this, but, um, what you're going to do is find your group and you see up here, we have group 1 next to that. We have the topic and it's going to be 1 of the 8 definitions that are 1 of the 8. Um, words that we discussed a minute ago um, below that you'll see the definitions and then the instructions. So, um. And it says, you know, and for this example, group 1, it says in the space below, write out disruptive behaviors that you've seen. Um, while watching the pre presentation or presenting. So in this white space below, you can use a couple of these tools that you see um, in this box right here. Um, you should see this when you get onto the Google Jamboard, um, but um, the best tools to use here are the sticky note and the text box. Uh, if you uh, feel an extra creative, you can even upload a picture. Uh, remember what we said earlier about you can communicate through images, um, but um, you got to make sure that it's, you know, that the image is a good image that uh, communicates what you're wanting to say. Uh, sometimes our words are a little easier for us to do, but um, I want to show you an example. Let's say we're in group five. So if you notice at the top, it says five out of 16. So you would find your page, it's got our, um, our topic, our definition and our instructions. And I'm just gonna show you what a sticky note looks like. And you can create it in any color you want. Um, and the text box, I actually kind of like the text because you can might write more um, when you select the text tool, you can make it larger, different colors, however you wanna do it. So, um, I want to see uh, in the chat box, are there any um, presentation or I'm sorry, any questions? And yes, um, this presentation is being recorded. Hey, All right, I'm good. hey Jordan. Hey, this is Jacqueline. How are you? Hey, Jacqueline. Good to hear from you. Good. <laughs> I had a quick question. I tried to go through and get the download of the slides, but I guess it depends on if you're on your phone or if you're on a computer, whether you have to create an account or not. And I tried to go through the PDF, but I couldn't, but I guess that could be for later. Yes, and um, Kristen has um, my um, my slides, and I think she will share that uh, with everyone later. I, I hope I'm not talking out of turn, Kristen. Okay. Great, thanks a lot, Jordan. Now, no, I actually, I am gonna share the slides with everyone after. Great. And yes, it's being recorded, and yes, there will be a certificate of attendance after you complete the evaluation. Thank you. So, do you want me to go on and start the breakout? Um, Yes, but well, actually, before you do, I am gonna put this in the chat box. Uh, let me, if there are no questions, I'm gonna put the, Oh, I've got it. Oh, you do? Okay. Thank I think you. the jam board there, so it's yes. in the chat. You can just click on it and you'll go to an external site. And uh, Mr. Uh, Leonard and I uh, will join your groups just to, uh, and the whole PTTC, uh, PTTC team will join to, uh, to just help. Uh, but we will see y'all in a second. So you should see under participants where you can go to your breakout group. And turn your cameras on when you're in there and engage with your collaborators. So breakout session two, we've only got one person in there.
So hopefully all of you still in the room can find your breakout session and move into that room. Some of you may have technical dif difficulties doing that, depending on the type of device that you're on. Jane, can you, do you see the room that you've been assigned? And JJ, JJ has gone. I'm looking for you, Jane, to see what room you're in. There she goes. All right, hopefully the recording can just stop. Now I've got to broadcast the Jamboard to everybody. Brian, did you make it into your breakout group? I literally just like joined this meeting because I had another meeting. Welcome, um, Brian. Yeah. So we are we just are moving into breakout rooms right now to do a group activity. Mm -hmm. um, do you want me to? Let me see. Where have you been assigned? Looks like breakout room two, maybe. Do you see? Yeah, that? but I, um, I actually went to the room and I was asking, and they said there was like a link that I should follow first. Of, I like just broadcast it to everybody. So if you want to go back in there, I'll broadcast it again so that okay. when you're in the room, you get it. Thanks for that. Okay, gotcha. And Kristen, could you please uh, make me the co-host when you get a moment so I can go into the rooms? Oh, why aren't you? Um, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Great. So much for uh, thank y'all very much for um, doing this activity and uh, it looked like every group that I saw was working together as a team discussing so excellent I'm so glad to see that um, let's I'm gonna share my screen really quick and we're gonna look at the jam boards so um, don't feel like you um, have to share 
but I am going to read some of these. And we're going to start, let's see, hopefully everyone can see my screen. Okay. So uh, we'll start with our over overachieving group. Now, some of these might not actually be, um, there may be some other groups that put this in, but um, we're going to look at uh, um, some disruptive behaviors that we've seen while watching the presentation. So um, this is the topic of disruptive behaviors, side conversations, uh, texting, um, in virtual meetings have conflicting demands. Thank you. That's a good one. Um, another one with virtual is when um, people are unmuted. Um, I have heard some things that I should not have heard. <laughs> you, you feel like, uh, okay, this is private information, but you're sharing it to everyone. Um, yeah, answering calls. Um, that actually happened for me one time in a meeting. Let's see. Arriving late. Uh, kids, they can be cute, but it can be a distraction, especially if uh, I, I don't have children, but I have, uh, we call them fur babies. And uh, when they get hungry, they uh, get very uh, barky. So that can be disruptive too. Yeah, um, having unresolved uh, cultural or communication issues. Thank you for sharing that. Um, lack of participation. Yes, um, that's I was so happy to see everyone participating in their group because it it really helps. Um, it helps the um, conversation go and it helps the learning uh, get a little stronger. I want to look at what the other group did for disruptive behavior. Um, we see the phone arriving late. That's that's absolutely is one. Um, hearing. Um, Audio from other um, presentations, maybe cubicle or thin walls. Um, multitasking, we see this a lot with online trainings. Um, constant questions. Questions can be great, but constant questions, I, I see how that could be a disruption, especially if they're not on topic or if they're questions about um, something that's not related to what's being discussed. Okay, um, any, anyone in group one or group nine want to add anything to um, what you all talked about? I think um, great, pre um, great participation on this. Okay, go on once, go on twice. You know, I just, uh, Jordan, Wait. I just thought of something. Something popped okay. up just now. Perfect. It's when we get triggered. Okay, give us sometimes a so sometimes we get triggered more or less by these disruptive behaviors, right? Some things bug us more or take us off course more. And one of the things that I brought up was that sometimes people that also hold some valuable knowledge and experience might be participants in the room and they step into a teacher zone and what they're offering as opposed to a receiver of the information, right? And that sometimes that can derail us and, and, and trigger us to say, oh, I, I, I'm not the expert or they think they're, or, you know, that somehow, so that when we get triggered by this disruptive behavior, it's important to pay attention to when and where that happens, that that's some work for us to pay attention to that we're just being, that's like a mirror being held up. I don't know, that's, that's maybe more of a multidimensional perspective on disruptive behavior, but I think it's important for us as presenters to be aware of our own places of triggering, because the work that we have to do about that happens outside of the classroom. And then we come back whole. I don't know. I just wanted to offer that perspective. No, thank you, uh, Astrid. That's um, an excellent uh, contribution because, uh, you know, and some things just might bother us more on a particular day than they do normally. Um, and honestly, I feel like how we respond to disruption is um, so important, probably the most important thing. So, um, yeah, I'm glad you said that. If something um, kind of irritates us and gets under our uh, skin and maybe triggers us, yes. So thank you so much. Anything else to add from group one or group nine? I do like that uh, group nine put uh, microphone feedback and technical issues because those happen. Those um, those happen when you're doing a presentation, even um, if you're at a conference doing a presentation, um, have multiple copies of your presentation 
and and um, be prepared to uh, do your um, presentation. Worst case scenario, maybe uh, maybe the projector goes out or your file can't be opened. It's always good to have um, a backup plan. But anything else to add? Group one or nine? Going once, going twice. All right, let's go to group two. Um, group two and um, ten. So uh, this is audience engagement. Um, write out signs of high and low audience engagement. So um, we have the lows on the left and the highs on the right. So um, camera off. Yes, that that I, I don't know how I feel about that because um, I, I I mean. Just because somebody's camera's off doesn't mean that they're not um, uh, or not participating. However, um, it took me a while to uh, get to that to that point because I always felt like if their camera's not on, they're not paying attention. Um, but that's not necessarily the case. But even in that case, it can still be kind of distracting. Uh, oh, and this is a good one too, especially when the camera's off and you have the crickets. No, no one's replying. Yes, looking uh, bored, looking tired, um, having other conversations, uh, other things take priority. High engagement, uh, responding to questions. Um, if uh, if virtual, a lot of chat in the discussion board um, and asking a lot of relevant questions. So in that case, asking questions can be a good sign or a sign of high um, audience engagement. Um, with group 10, um, they did the left and the right, it looks like as well. So, um, you know, texting and um, looking at phones, um, facial expression and nods, that could be, um, you know, that could go either way, honestly. Um, eye contact, especially in person, um, facing forward, nodding, um, yeah, and, uh, you know, showing that you're listening, also taking notes. Absolutely. If you say something and somebody's like, oh, let me write that down. That means they're writing that down because they, they value that information. So um, anything to add, group uh, two or 10? Going once, going twice. Okay. And let me see. Um, I don't have my chat pulled up. So, um, Kristen, will you watch the chat for me, please? Um, just uh, I will do. Yeah. Thank you. Someone said, speaking of disruptions, she has to jump jump off for a mandatory uh, meeting, and we'll be back. It it's hey it, these yeah. things. Happen. So um, I'm glad you were here. So um, group three um had communication skills. Group three and eleven, um, they um needed to write examples of good and bad. So let's uh. Okay, let's let's start let's start with the bad so we can finish with the good. Uh, with the bad, we got reading the slides to the audience. Yes, I hope I haven't been doing that a lot, but I'm always cognizant of it. Um, but yes, that can be boring because we can read, or um, you know, a lot of our audience members can read. However, you know, we have to um, you know um, use it. Um, you know, I always think it's a good idea to add something extra to um, to the slides, to the words on the page. And honestly, you don't want to just have a full block of text. No one likes looking at that. Um, using filler words like, uh, you know, I've been uh, fighting that battle my whole life, I'll be honest. Um, getting off topic, uh, been doing that as well. It's uh, it's uh, just constant improvement, though. You wanna you wanna constantly get better. Let's see. Um, gauging your audience's flexibility to make changes, not having your own agenda. Absolutely, it's. We'll talk about this uh, when we get back from break. But your um your plan is so important. Your agenda is so important. And you, you need to stay on it with your uh, presentation, no matter the length of the presentation. Um, speaking too softly, that can be that can be really hard to, you know, it can be difficult to uh, to gauge. 
Um, but I'm sorry, it can be difficult to, uh, it can be difficult for some people to gauge if they're not speaking loud enough, but um, it can be difficult for people to hear and speaking too quickly because words can run together and it can, um, it can be distracting. Now let's look at the positives. Um, speaking loud enough and projecting, uh, knowing your audience, being well prepared, all of those go into being prepared. Um, effective listening when answering questions. Absolutely, we don't want to be waiting for the next slide. We want to be uh, be here now, be in the moment. Um, yeah, and reading the slides absolutely can be um, a good thing for um, people with different learning styles and um, abilities. Um, there, um, there is one thing that I've heard with a like a multimedia strategy is you don't want to, you don't want to have you only want to have two types of multimedia going at once. So if you have text and you have someone reading, you also don't want to have a video at the same time, but um, reading the information uh, can be good, but you just don't want to read every single word on every single slide because uh, it, it can it can become a little monotonous. So um, great jobs, group three and eleven. Anything else to add? I feel like they nailed it. I think so too. All right, so let's move on to group four and groups four and 12. Can I say one more thing, Jordan? I just thought yes, of something. Please. please. And that so sometimes everybody. when I know that I have a mixed crowd of people, especially if we're talking about maybe um, folks that for uh, English is a second language or people uh, of different uh, abilities, develop, developmental abilities, what I'll say on the outset, maybe even looking at under the guidelines, is I'll say what we'll be doing today is we're going to be using a variety of different approaches. So we're really approaching everyone's learning preferences and styles. So it might not be for you, but but I can promise you it'll be for someone else in the room. So let's just embrace everyone. Let's let's keep the basket big and embrace all people's learning styles so that if you find me reading something word for word, it's because we want to en en uh, engage everyone in the room. So that way it kind of lays out the, the plan. And that way when people feel a little like, oh, come on, Astrid, what are you doing? They're remembering what I said at the beginning. That's good. And that goes back to guidelines too, setting your guidelines at the beginning. But um, yeah, thank you so much for sharing. Um, with conflict resolution, uh, we see the good old fashioned rock, paper, scissors. Um, yeah, sometimes you have to bring them out. Um, but I love this one about, um, you know, communicating for clarity and, um, you know, um, I, th I think that's extremely important uh, to make sure everyone's on the same page. That's one thing I love to do with the guidelines. Uh, and Astrid, what you just mentioned, example, excellent example of that, because you can go back to that and clarify it again if it gets a little muddy. Um, bring others into the conversation and highlight diversity of ideas. Absolutely. Uh, diversity is our greatest strength. And a conflict resolution, uh, I'm sorry, group 12, healthy disagreement can be okay. Um, clarifying the issue, finding a solution. I love that. And I really love this one in green, acting quickly um, and addressing emotions. Because as Astrid mentioned earlier, sometimes things can trigger not just us, but our audience members. So um, when we ask, act emotionally, it may be a little erratic. Um, so, um, we want to de-escalate that situation as quickly as we can. So, uh, anything to add groups 12 and 4? I think y'all uh, did great on that. All right, group 5, de-escalation techniques. Um, validating, um, be calm. Um, Trauma-informed approaches, that's interesting. I'm glad uh, y'all put that there. Body positioning and posture that is not threatening because how do people act if they're threatened? They're gonna they're gonna fight or flight, right? Um, having uh, good icebreakers, absolutely. Um, that can help. Let's see what our other group said. Whoops. 
Okay. Um, humor. I'm glad you put that. Um, and that that's a redirection tactic. Um, incentives or prizes, awards. Um, oh, I like that out. Get the wiggles out. Yeah. Hey, sometimes adults need to get the wiggles out too. So uh, groups 13 and five, great job. Anything to add though? I wanna give you all an opportunity if there's anything. Okay, group six, active listening. Um, examples of uh, signs that someone's not um, listening, looking at phone, um, eyes closed, just kind of in a different world. Uh, signs that they are, are um, let's see, um, listening, nodding, making eye contact, taking notes, yes. Uh, not listening, uh, once again, we have the phone again. Let's see. Yeah, um, repeated what was just said or saying what, um, you know, after uh, there's a break in conversation. Let's see. Next, um, our, our group 14, taking notes, head nodding. Uh, asking clarifying questions. That's good too, because we might not get it right. They call that um reflective listening sometimes. Um or yeah, and there it is right there, reflective statements. Um not uh signs that we're not um once again we see our friend the phone again. Um not listening, not being able to answer questions. Um a, a big sign is when somebody says, Can you repeat the question again? Not always, but a lot of times they they uh kind of zoned out for a moment all right Anything? can i make a quick point um that i think i put in the chat earlier but i'm not sure that it's been brought up yet um is that i think it's important that we apply a culturally humble lens and a trauma-informed yes. lens if at all possible when we're thinking about these things because a lot of this is very culture-based and yeah. um, for those of us that work in areas where cultural humility and trauma informed is really important to us, it can be applied to a lot of these things. So I just want people to also think about how people respond, what we place our expectations on them, what behaviors people are presenting, how we're emotionally reacting to what we're seeing or what we're doing or what we're asking people to do. Step back and try to treat that with a culturally humble and trauma-informed lens. Um, yeah, because these are not really black and white things yes. when you approach them from a culturally humble place and a trauma-informed place. And if you don't know how to do that for your local community or the people that are in the room, then that's really a place for individual and team and organizational professional development. Um, and it's okay to ask for those things. Yeah, thank you so much, Darcy. And a lot of that goes into knowing our audience, um, know who we're speaking to, knowing the culture. Yeah, but, but sometimes we can't know the specifics and we shouldn't know the specifics it's, and it's in violation of things like ADA and, and yes. privacy of information and HIPAA and things like that. Um, you can't know the ins and outs and whys um, and we shouldn't always know them, but we should be predictive of them and aware of the possibilities and compassionate about it doesn't fit my framework for what I want, but maybe in their contest, it's exactly what they need to do. Yes, thank you so much. Yeah. No, thank you very much for adding that because we, we do need to think of uh, culture in all um, aspects of everything we do, especially I, I say that. Um, so, you know, prevention specialists, I know um, cultural competency is a part of our entire approach, but thank you very much, Darcy. All right, anything else to add? Yes, Angela sorry. commented in the chat that it's important to remember some people listen better when their hands are busy. So, you know, I've had people knitting in my presentations. I've had people doodling, and I know that that is not a sign of, um, not listening, whereas phone scrolling certainly might be. Yes. And then if I could add, 
Uh, I would love to add too much presentation and not enough passion. Mm. Yes. Absolutely. So explain what you mean by that, though. Uh, sometimes we can be so uh, perfectly uh, presenting our slides and not be passionate in the way we present it. Um, I'm a firm believer that if you're going to engage people in any presentation, you first of all have to take it off you and put it on them. And that comes with your intro and how your presentation is set up. And you can, and, and by doing that, you are actually searching the room. Uh, I heard the young lady say earlier about doodling. Whenever people are doodling, um, I, I did a presentation. I was a certified facilitator in industry before I came in, in, into prevention. And we used to have this, uh, uh, we had a training called uh, Grunnels. And just by the people, the way people motion, uh, their hand motion, the slumping in the seat, the sitting up with the hands on the table, uh, you have to search the room and then you can grab them. But if we aren't passionate in our presentations, the presentation is, it, 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 is not any good because people are not going to get anything from it. And I'm in group five and I told group five this, and I, I know we have to go farther. Uh, one of the things that I do, instead of having ice breakers, I have break the ice. Okay. And sometimes they take putting cups of ice on every table and a hammer <laughs> with some plastic under it and get in the team to break that ice. And you'll be amazed at how different it is, how engaging it is, and how people are set up, and they'll be a part of the presentation. Because I don't want to present a presentation and I'm not passionate with it. it, it, it it's no good. Well, uh, Xavier, I got to tell you, I am writing that down. Um, actually breaking the ice. So, no, I thank you for sharing that. Um, no, excellent comments and like I said, we can always learn, um, not just from the presenter, but from um, our audience members. There's so much to learn. So thank you for sharing that. All right, I don't want, I, we're gonna go for a couple more minutes and then I um, will take our first break. So um, we have group. Can I just offer one more piece, one more thing I've observed? Please. Please. Oftentimes, it depends on what is being said in the moment, either it's a sharing from other participants or it could be a part of the presentation where maybe we're listening to something, that oftentimes people close their eyes so they can be more fully present in the moment. Meaning, if I, because a lot of folks like myself, if my eyes are open, I'm, I'm looking, I see everything, I notice the little, I notice, you know, all the stuff in the room. So for me to be fully, mindfully present in the moment, I close my eyes to give it my complete 100% attention. And I've seen that happen in the room as well. So that's one more example of how people might be listening more deeply, but in a way that might appear that they're listening less. Yes, absolutely. And, and honestly, like these are, um, it, a, a lot of these really depend on the person and and you know it's difficult sometimes if you're speaking to uh, an audience that you don't know um but um yeah i i mean it almost seems like all of these there are exceptions to but thank you so um real quickly i'll go through our last four groups um this is presentation skills um Give examples of how you've used presentation skills in a non-presentation setting. So being prepared, I love that. Being clear about your message. Yes. Um, you know, talking to multiple people. Yes, that's, I mean, that is like your elevator speech. That is your, you know, you are, you're telling people about you. You're informing them about who you are and what you do. Um, I love this about nonverbal communication as well. Um, while doing uh, parent training, uh, giving full attention, absolutely, and people see that when you uh, when you do that for them. Um, I love. Hey, we have a picture here. Excellent. Um, you know, in job interviews, uh, Socratic seminars, de-escalating situations. You have to uh, you have to know your audience. You have to um, know the situation. Uh, CFT meetings. I'm I'm not clear what that is. If somebody would like to uh, put that in the chat box or 
Uh, that was me, uh, children family therapy meetings. Wonderful. Yeah, I'm not familiar with that term, but uh, absolutely. Like anytime you're around people, you have because you want to present yourself um, professionally. That's that's a presentation skill. Great. All right, our last two groups: classroom management. A few um, about the presentation skills. I guess it's more to really the development of the presentation. But Brian talked about. It can be challenging when someone's use. he doesn't like it when people use different fonts and some fonts are harder to read than other fonts. And then also people who experience um, partial or full color blindness. Um, yeah. I've given a presentation before and someone said, I can't read any of that. And I thought, oh, I didn't even think of that. So being mindful of those things as well. Yes, and accessibility in general too mm -hmm. is uh, very important. Mm -hmm. Extremely important. Thank you, Brian. Okay, um, let's see. Give examples of uh, strategies you've used. Everybody put their hands up in the air. That checks to see if people are paying attention. Um, the calm down corner, offer um, a Q&A timeframe that can um, kind of uh, um, stop a bunch of uh, the questions or um, the session from getting off topic. Um, Setting ground rules, absolutely. Our guidelines, we um, went to that. Um, yeah, getting accessibility trained, learning, whoops, um, learning how um, presentation backgrounds, yeah, font colors, yeah, absolutely. And our last group, whoops, going too far. Uh, separate. Sometimes you have to separate um, students and people from one another. Um, rewarding those that participate. Um, give opportunities for them to share anything in between. If there's a break or something, or if there's a uh, you know a moment before you move on to another topic. Um, asking for contributions. Um, yeah, these are all excellent. So um, thank y'all very very much for. Uh, for um, sharing this with all of us, and uh, and thank you all for um, sharing afterwards too. And now I see the chat box, but uh, thank you all again. We will, um, if it's all right, we will um, take about um, let's go um, eight minutes and then come back at two twenty-five. And then I will see you all in a few minutes. Thank you. So we will continue our discussion now talking about theory, starting with the proper planning. I really feel that uh, <clears throat> planning is the most important thing you can do for a presentation. Um, great presentations have uh, at least have these three components. They're well prepared well-researched, and well-presented. And we'll go into a little detail on all of these. Uh, with well-prepared, and this is why I feel it's so important to have a good plan. We have to know who are we presenting for? Who is our audience? Um, why do they need to know this? Um, how will it benefit them? Like, what's the point? Like, why, what, what's in it for them, essentially? Then we need to look at the material. What, uh, what's the material? What, uh, you may have to do some research. You may have to um, read new research that have, have just come out because things, uh, things change. And it's important if you're presenting um, on any topic that you give the most um, up-to-date and relevant information. And this is a very important question to ask too when thinking about uh, preparing. What's the best delivery method for the uh, information? Or is, is, a, is a virtual training the best? And it may be. Um, for, for an event like this, I absolutely think it is. Uh, but this this could also be presented uh, in an in-person capacity as well. But there are some 
uh, trainings that just do not lend well to the virtual environment. So, and, and that's very important to know on the front end, because then that will help you um, design and develop your presentation. Now, um, let's see, instructional design is uh, a topic we're gonna spend a little bit of time on. It's uh, the process of creating uh, training materials uh, and experiences with the goal of improving learner outcomes. It has to do with analyzing the needs of learners and designing um, information that's, or designing presentations that are relevant for them. Once again, going back to, to the whole um, knowing your audience, what, what will be beneficial for them? Um, it helps you uh, design, develop, and evaluate the materials and the activities to help those people meet those needs. It's uh, this process of instructional design. It usually um, involves defining learning objectives and selecting strategies of design and uh, instruction implementation. It also helps uh, create content and activities. And most important, well, one of the most important things is it helps you assess how, how beneficial is this? How, how impactful um, is this something that's working? So instructional design is extremely important. Um, I do devote a good bit of time to this. Uh, I'll just do a quick pulse check. And I want to see if, um, and you can write this in the chat box. Have you used any instructional design models in the past? And Astrid, thank you for putting that in. Um, yes, absolutely. It's, um, we can include that discussion while we're talking about instructional design because it goes back to our um, our previous slide where um, what's the best method of delivery? Okay, I'm seeing a lot of no's. I love seeing the no's. And Astrid, if that didn't quite answer it, we can revisit that at the uh, end if you don't mind. So um, the instructional design process, yeah, not knowingly, great. We're gonna go over some of these. I promise you do, um, or, or you know something that's very, very similar. We're gonna talk about a model in a minute that you're gonna say, that sounds really familiar. But um, the process typically involves um, creating and defining learning objectives and um, selecting the instructional strategies and uh, creating that content. And once again, we wanna assess how effective is our learning? Why would we use something like instructional design? Well, it helps us do a couple of things. Um, it helps improve learning outcomes uh, because we are thinking of our learners at the very beginning, and we're designing materials and activities for them to help them meet those needs. Um, it, uh, the instructional design helps us improve the quality of learning, and it helps us increase those learning outcomes. It makes uh, learning more efficient, makes it um, what, uh, what is taught, makes it kind of stick, make it, makes it stay around, maybe a little, uh, longer than maybe just a one shot presentation. Or if you were to just uh, get information one time and then never hear it again, when you include uh, instructional design, it can really um, make that learning more efficient. It helps elevate engagement and get uh, the participants engaged in your presentation. And then finally, it helps us adapt because that is a very key part of this. It, it's flexible and it um, you know, can help us meet the changing needs of the people that we are presenting to. 
overall, it, it helps us create high quality learning experiences um, that meet the needs of the learners. And it helps to uh, lead to improved learning outcomes and increased efficiency. So instructional design is, uh, is something that I'm relatively new to, um, just a couple of years into uh, learning about it, but it's honestly something I wish I would have uh, learned a lot sooner because it, it really um, makes you think strategically about your um, presentations. Now, we're going to talk about uh, three instructional design models. I'm not sure if any of these ring a bell or not. We're going to talk about Addy, and then Gagne's nine events, and then Kirkpatrick's four levels. Now, uh, some of this stuff is is kind of, you know, higher than just a, you know, a, a, hey, I just want to learn how to do um, a presentation. I promise that um, knowing, knowing this theory will help your practice. So let's start with the Addy model. Um, <clears throat> it provides a systematic approach um, when creating uh, instructional materials for people. And this is the one that I said might be familiar, especially to some of the prevention people. So we uh, start off with analysis. Uh, we gather information about the learners and their needs, as well as the uh, goals and objectives of the program. Then we move to the design phase. And in this phase, um, we start to um, gather information or we look at the information that we gathered and we start to plan our program, including our um, strategies that we're gonna use to get the information across, the content, the assessments that we're gonna use. Then we get to the develop stage. Now, with this phase, we um, actually create the materials. We create the PowerPoints or the um, Canvas is another, or I'm sorry, Canva is um, uh, a presentation platform I've seen recently and it looks wonderful. It, um, so, um, and I think they have um, free versions of Canva that you can create wonderful designs with. And, um, but you would do that in the, uh, the uh, development phase. You would also, um, if it's a uh, longer form uh, instruction, you would create the lesson plans for, for each module or each um, lesson that you have. And then finally, um, you would collect any multimedia re um, resource that you have. Like if you have any videos you would like to include they need to be a part of the development phase. And I would definitely recommend to embed your videos if you have any, um, save the file from wherever your source is from, usually YouTube, but save that file and um, embed it in your presentation. Uh, that way it's a part of your presentation and it will not, um, um, you shouldn't have any kind of, uh, you definitely won't have any like internet connection issues, but you, you, it should run smooth for you. And then we get to our next step, implementation. And this is where we uh, we actually get the information to the learners. So a lot has happened before you get the presentation to the learners. Um, I know some people say, oh, you can just throw a presentation together like that, and you can, but how effective is it gonna be? And um, how impactful is it gonna be? And then in the middle, we see our final phase, evaluate, and we see that this is a part of all of the other steps. And uh, this helps us assess how effective is our program? How in fact, uh, effective um, is this? Are people learning? Is this relevant for them? Uh, and we have to um, evaluate on each step. I will say this reminds me a lot of the SPIF model because you're not just jumping in and implementing a program. You have to do a needs assessment and build capacity and then plan before you implement. So um, I do like this uh, model. I actually used this one for um, this presentation. I'll kind of give you an example of how I did that. So um, the task 
create a three hour presentation for substance abuse prevention and other mental health related professionals on the topic of engaging or of creating engaging presentations. So using our ADDI model with analysis, I um, you know, wanted to find out who's the audience um, and what's um, what's something that I um, I feel and I'm uh, I'm connected to this audience because I really am passionate about prevention and I was kind of putting myself into the shoes like what would I have liked to know um, when I first started giving presentations. Um, so that's kind of how I did the analysis stage. The um, the um, design stage that's when I really. Um, started working with Kristen and developing our um, our objectives and our learning outcomes and um, looking at how how do I want this uh, presentation to go. Then we moved to the development stage. This is where we actually I actually started to create the the um, presentation and think, oh, this would be a good video. And honestly, the video I'm going to show today is not the first one that I chose. So sometimes what works in our head might not work um, in practice. And that's why um, it's important to develop before we just say, OK, let's try this. Um, and that can be a big issue with, um, you know, thinking of certain cultures as well. We, we, um, we always have to keep cultural competence in the forefront um, with us. Um, and um, you know, make sure that the uh, materials that we are um, presenting um, are um, culturally competent. And then the fun part, this is what we're doing today. We're implementing it today. So all that nervous energy, all that preparation, it's starting to, starting to pay off. Hopefully, we'll find out when we move to the final step, um, when we um, evaluate this and see, is this effective? Um, did um did uh, we cover all of the um, intended outcomes? Um, did did you do you feel like you learned anything? So that's kind of a just a brief, um, I guess uh, maybe not too brief step into my mind how I kind of plan this out. But I do this with a lot of my um, um, presentations. I um, I uh, really do like this uh, principle, I and I do think it, it's because it kind of reminds me of the SPIF model. Um, yeah, Canva is excellent. Um, yes, and I didn't want to say that, um, Jessica, but now that you say that, I, I realize I didn't I didn't stumble into it by accident. But uh, there um, there is a um, I think you can get a license for free for Canva. If you're a nonprofit and you provide all of that information, um, and it's it's a great tool, it really is wonderful. Um, a word about learning objectives, real quick. Um, you may have heard of this Bloom's taxonomy. Um, it moves from uh, there are uh, six levels. It's kind of, uh, you know a hierarchy. It's a taxonomy, um, but um, we often say we want to have action verbs in our um, in our uh, learning objectives or learning outcomes, well, learning objectives in this case. Um, and I do want you to know uh, the, uh, the higher the number, uh, the more likely we are to retain that um, information as learners. But it is kind of, it, that's something that we're not gonna be able to do in one session. Um, for instance, um, you know, um, if this were, um, say this were a three part series, we could, the first parts, we could focus on maybe the first two, the knowledge and understanding, kind of getting our definitions, kind of knowing what we don't know and learning, learning um, maybe some newer concepts. And then we, um, in the second session, we could apply and uh, analyze and, and we could start to uh, take the information that we learned and start to kind of incorporate it. And then hopefully, you know, with, with something like that, if it was a three part series, we would have it to where, you know, you would create an outline and then we could provide feedback. Like, I think that, but that's something that we can't do in um, one day. Um, sometimes we only have a, one hour. There's, there's just so much we can do. So I usually stick with these first two 
uh, the knowledge and understanding. I like to define a lot and um, summarize, compare and contrast. I think that's good um, for for the lower levels, but um, we really would like to get to the level where people are actually inventing and creating and writing um, their own um, whatever they're trying to learn. Uh, in this case, it would be, you know, like presentations. Um, any questions before I move on? That was Addie. Very quick. Now, um, I will have some resources. I'll be glad to share those. Yes. Anything to add or any questions? I have a question. Um, so for Bloom's taxonomy, this that we're looking at right now. Yes. These are procedural steps. So we want to start with one and end at six. Well, I'm just trying to understand how to use this model because okay, I'm, I'm a so. little at lost here. <laughs> okay. So, and I'm definitely not an expert on this, but the way I understand it is um, we, these are um, all um, all of these words we see are words that we want to um, we want to incorporate in our trainings in some way. Obviously, we're not going to be able to incorporate all of these, um, you know, in one training. Um, gosh, some of these, um, you know, you can't even do in a semester class. But um, using that example, like a semester class, say it's on creative writing. Um, the end goal of that would be to create. Um, you, you know, a, a work of your own based off of the principles that you learned about that were defined and then you began to apply those concepts. Um, so um, this is really just a way to kind of uh, categorize, um, categorize words in a way that will um, help that person learn more from it. Um, the lower the number, um, not it's the learning is not as impactful, uh, meaning that it's not going to uh, stay. Um, it's it's not going to be retained most likely very long unless if you keep adding to that by um, adding multiple levels, like almost like you were saying, like steps upon steps, just proceeding. Is, it, is that helping at all? I think I'm like starting to understand that this is a model that if you build from one to six, you're creating more dynamic learning Absolutely. that you can exist in one, but it's going to be very shallow or that th th these are procedural steps to develop complex, functional, replicatable, teachable levels of learning. I just needed to understand how this was applied because just looking at it as a as a model didn't mm -hmm. show me or tell me anything. Yeah, it's, it's <laughs> it was just words. words it was sense. lists of synonyms, yes. right? It was a thesaurus without yes. context. Um, yes, okay. I definitely. Um, um, and models are pretty complex inherently, so they take some contextualization. <laughs> yes, and. Um, like essentially, like it, it would it would not be fair for me to expect an audience um, to create a logic model if they did not understand what a logic model was, if that makes sense. So we would have to teach. You know, you, you got to teach at the level of um, of where that audience is. Um, so that's why I say if it's an introductory class, if it's like a one hour class, there's only so much that you can do in one hour. Um, you know, I, I usually keep it around level one or two. Um, and sometimes we do have classes um, at our institute where we'll have like a 101 and then a 201. And that 201 will build upon what we talked about um, in the 101 class. Astrid has something she wanted to add. Yes. Well, I just wanted to make sure because Darcy, I'm so glad because it's looking the same way to me. Okay, so if I want my participants to leave with knowledge, 
Yes. I will use the list underneath to help to craft my development. If I want people to understand or know how to apply the knowledge, I will be looking at including solving something, changing something, relating something, sketching something, articulating, and so on. So if I want my, my folks to leave with the number, the color word at the top that connects with the number, I want to make sure that I'm doing the activities in the workshop then to attain the colored word. Yes. Okay. Oh, absolutely. And um, Kristen has a great comment where she uh, likes to consider these um, as she um, writes her learning objectives. So, for instance, um, say I, you know, um, like with the knowledge, I would define what the Addy model is and why it's relevant. When we move to level two, I would maybe, and kind of like I did briefly, we compared it to the, um, I compared it to the SPIF model, but we could compare and contrast. That's adding a little more than just a definition. So now you're starting to not just know that, or not just um, know the definition, you're starting to kind of understand it and dive a little deeper into that concept. Does that make sense? And uh, hey, I'm, I appreciate all of these comments because um, that's letting me know I need to uh, explain this a little better. But these are just all of um, all of the models we're going to talk about are just um, are ways for us to um, make our presentations better and to kind of um, just add add more thought into it. Um, and I'll be honest, if you write really um, if you write strong learning objectives, it's it's so helpful in developing um, your outline and then your um, rough draft and then your final draft. It really helps with it. You know, Jordan, I'm I'm realizing that this using this model could also be really useful during like coalition meetings. I'm a coordinator of a of a local prevention coalition, and I'm imagining that if I we're wanting folks to evaluate something. Then, if I'm only giving them knowledge in the number one column, if I'm only reciting, if I'm only giving them data and quoting research, that's not going to assist them in evaluating something. And no. so they have to bring forward this. So it's in any setting, not just in a presentation, but it, it, it depending on what we do, that will give us a level of engagement. You know, it helps with assisting with getting the engagement we're looking for. Absolutely. Absolutely, because I mean, it, knowledge builds upon itself and um, I always say, um, I always like to teach from the uh, known to the unknown. So it's, and it is, a, it's a long process sometimes to, to learn more about a topic. Like you're not going to become an expert on a topic in an hour or maybe after even one class, you're not going to be an expert on it, but you're going to know a lot more than the average person, but there's still a lot more to know and evaluate and understand completely. But thank you. Yeah, that's great. Um, knowledge is knowing what uh, that a, a, a fork is a utensil, but understanding is know what, knowing what to do with the fork. Wisdom is knowing when to use the fork. I love that quote. I'm going to borrow that. I'll go through this model really quick. This is uh, Gagne's nine events of instruction. This um, this was basically um, developed um, to kind of show um, the psychological principles of learning. So here's an example of uh, the nine events of instruction according to Gagne. Um, first, you have to gain the person's attention. Let the let the person know what is going to happen know the objectives, stimulate a recall of prior learning. So now they're starting to uh, like, hey, remember, well, and I'll give you all an example of this in a second. Uh, four, present the new content. Um, five, you would uh, want to uh, provide learner guidance. Six, elicit performance from the learner. Seven, provide feedback. Eight, assess the performance, and then nine, enhance retention and transfer to the job. Um, that's really what we want, the job and the life, you know, 
Um, you want it to be uh, impactful, something that lasts a while. So here's my little crude example of this. Uh, it breaks it down really simply. Hey, you. Today, we're going to talk about this topic. Remember when um, we met last month and we talked about this? Okay, so here's something just like that, but it's it's new. Here's something to help you understand this new principle. Now, tell me what you would what, what you think of this and explain this to me. And then you would provide feedbacks and that's great. Um, but this is how you can improve or you, you got just about everything except for this. You got this confused. And um, then finally, you will um, you will get to the point where they retain it because they're getting that positive feedback and they're going to uh, en enhance their retention. Uh, hopefully transfer it to their job, transfer it to the, uh, their um, skills. It's, but I do think that this is a good way to just kind of break down his nine events of instruction. Um, with, but it all starts at gaining attention. If you can't gain the attention, that's that's why icebreakers are are so important because it gets um, it gets the audience it gets the audience engaged. It gets their attention. But um, if at any point you get you know, and this is this is a model I do use as well, especially when teaching from a, teaching a new topic, like something that's um, completely new, because I'm going to have to be able to relate it um, to an older topic or a topic that we've discussed in the past. Um, I used to do I used to teach English, and uh, I would I didn't realize that at the time, but I was using some of these events, especially. Um, stimulating recall when we would move to a new book because it would be, um, let's say, okay, remember um, in this or book we discussed maybe even a year prior, remember when this happened, this is kind of like that. So um, it's just getting people to think. And the last model I want to talk about is Kirkpatrick's four levels of evaluation. Um, evaluation is extremely important. And um, with uh, with this model, it's it's just a great framework for seeing how effective our trainings are. So these are our four levels. I'll go through these real quick. They're um, reaction, learning, behavior, and result. So with level one, it's you know it measures the learner's immediate reaction to the training program. That's probably the level we're going to be at today. Um, were the uh, learning objectives met? Um, was uh, um, was it effective? Usually, it's it's um, completed in a survey format. With level two learning, have the participants applied um, what they learned from the training? Now, with that, that would be um, you know you. Do that sometimes with pre and post test. It's difficult to do for one day. I, I'm not really sure how effective it is. It's I'll go in and say it's not very effective for a one day presentation, um, but rather a um, if I used to implement some prevention programs that would last eight weeks. That was really um, that was a really good level for us to be at uh, that learning level. We could incorporate the pre and post test. And see if perceptions of uh, harm of uh, substances change from the beginning of the eight weeks until the end. Uh, level three is behavior. Um, this measures where, whether the learner um, is applying what they learned uh, to their job, have their skills improved. And then finally, results. This is the final level of evaluation, and it measures the impact of the uh, program um, on the uh, on the main goal, the main um, objectives. Um, with a prevention program, um, you know it can be uh, assessed usually through um, through outcomes. Outcome data um, has. Uh, let's think. Let's think about uh, maybe it's a. Um, an evidence based program that you're presenting about underage drinking. Have, um, 
have the perceptions of harm gone down since uh, you implemented that program? If so, I mean, that's that's showing a result. And um, that is kind of what we're looking for. But asking that question after one training, it's it's you're going to get the same results. So any questions about, I know I went through uh, Gagne's nine events and this one relatively quick. Um, I just want to make sure we get to the disruption part of this, but any questions about either of these two? Like I said, this is more theoretical. Um, you might not really use these, but when you, when you really look at it and uh, uh, when you, when you really look at um, like the events and you really start to break down your presentation, you're like, yeah, I'm kind of already doing that already. And, you know, I didn't do that part. Maybe I need to add that in the future and it, it can really um, um, add um, to your presentation. And then we always want to evaluate, are we effective? Is this, is this worth our time? Is, do we need to uh, teach this another way? Do we need to teach another uh, topic? I like the Gagne is nine levels, and I, I think that's nice for an every presentation. And then Kirkpatrick strikes me as being useful for across the program as a whole. Yes. <laughs> measuring knowledge change to hopefully getting to some behavior change at the end. Yes, and that's what we want. We want those results. We want to be at that uh, result level. So, um, what I just did is an example of what not to do. I'm seeing that now. Um, but that's the fire hose approach. Uh, this uh, is a teaching or training method where you have a large amount of information just um, delivered in a short uh, period of time. Uh, it can be overwhelming. And I uh, do apologize uh, if what I just presented was a little overwhelming. Um, but like I said, the information is uh, in your slides and on our uh, on our resource page. Those are wonderful resources that go into uh, um, go into great detail on all of those. But the fire hose, well, actually, I'm going to ask you all this. We'll do another chat storm. So um, we'll, uh, we're, we're doing recall now. Remember when we, uh, we learned what a chat storm was and we have to write our answer in the chat box, but don't hit enter just yet. Do you think that the fire hose approach is an effective way to learn new information. I'll give you about 15 seconds on this. Do you think the fire hose approach is an effective way to learn new information? Okay, in three, two, one, let's release our answers. Oh, good. I, I'm glad we saw a, uh, it depends and a not generally. It can be in certain situations. Um, if, uh, if there is a crisis um, and people have to be trained on, uh, on uh, the, the new strategy that's uh, being, um, that's being used, um, it, it might be good. You have to get all of that information out real quick. It's usually, um, in like an, an emergency, excuse me, an emergency management type situation, it can be, um, but generally it's not. Um, you know, it's it it can be effective in those situations, but usually it's not the most effective um, in other learning contexts. Um, it can lead to information overload. The good news is, I just found this out a couple of weeks ago. There is no capability or there's no stopping what we can learn. We can learn like we're never going to get to a point where our brain is just completely full and we can't learn. We can't intake any new information. We'll never get to that point. But we can get to the point where our eyes start to glaze over and we're like, oh, my gosh, this is so much information. Um, and then at that point, you're not really paying attention to what's um, being brought in. So generally, it's not seen to be um, the most um, most effective way. But um, it is important to consider uh, the type of information that's being taught and uh, the learner's learning styles. 
and the context in which the, lear the learning is taking place when determining whether the fire hose approach is effective or not. So um, we have to look at our learning styles, which is what we're about to do, and we will take a break in a moment. Um, you know, um, it's it's not enough to just, just to have that one trial learning. You do want to um, be able to um, add a little more to that if you can. Um, you can't expect people to remember everything that a lecturer said one time six months ago. You have to keep um, adding um, strength to those um, to those new things that you're learning. So hopefully nobody's looking like this. This was the hardest part of our presentation today. Um, 